Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on the heart. In this video, what we're going to do is discuss the cardiac action potential. Okay, which is quite different from the action potential of nerve cells. So, uh, we're going to study uh, the different components of the cardiac action potential. And the format for this video is that we're going to start off by looking at the way that a cardiomyocyte gets depolarized, and then we'll look at what proceeds, basically. So we'll then look at uh, the initial depolarization that occurs in the cardiac action potential, where the NAV 1.5 channels open and allow sodium into the cell. We'll then look at uh, the potassium cell, uh, the potassium channels, rather, which uh, allow potassium to uh, leave the cell transiently and cause that little blip in the cardiac action potential. We'll then look at the plateau phase and then the repolarizing portion. Okay, so let's start off with the initial depolarization. Okay, so let's say we have a cardiomyocyte here. Okay, and let's say this cardiomyocyte is already undergoing an action potential, and it's going to induce an action potential in its neighbor, which is sitting here. Okay, and then we're going to study the action potential in the neighboring cell here. So this is cardiomyocyte B, and this is cardiomyocyte A. Cardiomyocyte A is under, already undergoing an action potential, and it's going to spread this action potential to cardiomyocyte B. So, cardiomyocyte A is undergoing an action potential. Now, even if we don't know anything about the cardiac action potential yet, which we're pretending we don't, then um, we know that there's going to be some sort of depolarization of the membrane. And I'm going to tell you that that is going to be caused by uh, an influx of sodium into the cell, just like in nerves. Okay, so you've got a few more sodium ions in the intracellular compartment than you would normally have. So let's have these here. Okay, and these are responsible for the depolarization of the electrical potential difference across this membrane because they are raising the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment because they're positively charged. Okay, right. So, what you have between two adjacent cardiomyocytes like this is an electrical window known as a gap junction. So let's just have a little bit of a discussion about what gap junctions are. So, gap junctions between cardiomyocyte A and cardiomyocyte B are made up of two connexons. So each cardiomyocyte, cardiomyocyte A here, which provides this orange connexon, and cardiomyocyte B here, which provides a purple connexon, okay, what's going to happen is these two connexons are going to bind together and form the gap junction. So the entire thing here, the orange and the purple, that is called a gap junction, okay? Um, and there are other names that you will occasionally hear people use for gap junctions. Another name that you will occasionally hear is, you might hear them called nexus, is... Okay, so you might call this referred to as a nexus. Or you can also hear it referred to as a macula, meaning a spot, basically, of communication. So macula communicans. Okay, so just a point of communication between two adjacent cardiomyocytes. Right, okay, so um, these two half channels as they, as they effectively are, because the gap junction is made up of this dimerization of these two pieces, and each cardiomyocyte provides one of these pieces, and these pieces are known as a connexon. So this is a connexon. Now the other name for a connexon is to call it a gap junction hemichannel, which is quite a sensible name, because the gap junction is effectively a channel between cardiomyocyte A and B. So each of these connexons, which have to dimerize to become the full channel, is effectively a hemichannel, or a half channel. So this is a gap junction hemichannel. Okay, so uh, a gap junction then, is effectively a tunnel between cardiomyocyte A and cardiomyocyte B. Now let's go into the structure of these connexons in a bit more detail. Okay, so if we draw out a 
single connexon now, so not the dimer of connexons, not the gap junction anymore. Let's say I've got the uh, cell membrane of cardiomyocyte A here, and it's got this connexon in it. So here is the connexon of cardiomyocyte A here. Okay, so I will colour it in orange to denote that it's the same one as I had drawn up there. So here is the connexon that cardiomyocyte A provided. And basically, these connexons, they are a channel, so they have this nice pore going through them, and they are a hexamer, so they're made up of six pieces. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. So I'll divide it up into these four pieces, uh, sorry, six pieces, so they are a hexamer. Now, each one of these individual six pieces, which makes up the connexon protein overall, or the gap junction hemichannel, is known as a connexin protein. So one of these individual proteins here, so if I colour it in pink here, one of these individual proteins here, this is known as a connexin protein. So this is a connexin protein, okay? Um, and there are many different types of connexin proteins. Um, so uh, we have a huge number of genes encoding for proteins which can actually be used in these six slots to make a connexon. So this means that you can make an awful lot of different connexons. Uh, and uh, there is a scope to make them, to let this go very, very complicated, basically. Uh, we won't do that. But basically, you can either form hexamers which are made of the same connexin protein six times, i.e. you take one of these connexin genes, you um, produce the protein associated with it six times, and then you put all six of them together to make what's known as a homohexama. Homo meaning same, and hexama meaning a six-membered uh, structure. So you've put six of them to, of the same uh, connexin proteins together to make a homohexama. Okay? Uh, or you uh, can use different connexin proteins in, different, in, the different six, in the six different slots, and then what you'll get is a heterohexama, meaning different hexama, and that's because the connexin proteins that you're using in the different slots are different. Okay, right, so that's uh, the structure of a connexon. I think we'll go into one last little bit of detail, which is the actual structure of a connexin protein, and then we'll be finished with this. Okay, so the structure of a connexin protein, as far as the membrane spanning topology is concerned, each one of these pink proteins, it spans the membrane four times. So this is its membranous structure. So here is the amino terminus of the protein, and here is the carboxyl terminus. So this is the polypeptide spanning here. So I've coloured it in pink to make everything even more transparent. Okay, so each one of these pink sort of sixth, sixth of a uh, connexon is one of these, basically. It's a little snake crossing the membrane uh, four times, basically, with both the amino and the carboxyl terminus on the intracellular aspect. You put six of these together, sorry, yes, yeah, six of these together to make a connexon, and then each of the cardiomyocytes produces a connexon, binds the two of them together, and then what you get is a complete channel between cardiomyocyte A and cardiomyocyte B, and that channel, that electrical window that's going to allow ions to move from cardiomyocyte A to cardiomyocyte B is what's known as a gap junction, or a nexus, or a macular communicans. Right, okay, so the important thing to understand is that when cardiomyocyte A undergoes an action potential and has these additional sodium ions which are making the intracellular compartment more positive, basically, some of these sodium ions are going to be able to diffuse through the um, gap junction here and go into cardiomyocyte B, okay? And when you bring in those additional sodium ions into cardiomyocyte B, what's it going to do to the electrical potential difference across that, uh, across that cell membrane? Well, when we say the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, what we really mean is the electrical potential difference from extracellular compartment 
two inches out of the compartment. Now, what does that mean? Well, basically, it means that if you got a little man to stand in the extra cell of the compartment and measure electrical potential, he would get a certain value. Okay, so there's a certain electrical potential, which I'll denote E, of the extra cell of the compartment. So I'll denote E subscript E for ex electrical potential of the extra cell of the compartment. Similarly, there's a certain electrical potential of the intracellular compartment. So if the little man who was initially extracellular moved intracellular, he could also measure the electrical potential intracellularly. What this means is how much would his reading change if he moved from extracellular to intracellular. So if we want to ask how much will it change, basically we need to take the new value, which is the electrical potential intracellularly, and subtract off the old value, which is the electrical potential extracellularly. That is what is meant by the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. It means the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment subtract the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment, or how much different is the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment compared to the extracellular compartment. Compartment. Okay, now in cardiomyocytes, this is usually negative 85 millivolts. Now, what does that mean? That means that the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment is lower than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment, and it's lower by 85 millivolts. Now, if you are bringing in positive charges, then you will raise the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment. This number will get bigger. So the amount by which the electrical potential of the, extra, uh, of the intracellular compartment is lower than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment will decrease, i.e. this number negative 85 will become more positive, or this 85 here, this will become lower, basically. So you're going to depolarize the membrane, you're going to go up towards zero. Okay, uh, and it's because of these sodium ions moving in from cardiomyocyte A, which is undergoing an action potential, and they're moving in through these gap junctions, these electrical windows between the two cardiomyocytes. Okay, and we'll discuss the consequences of this in the next video.